Hey, what's up? And welcome back to another episode of the Relationship Schools podcast. I'm your host, Jason Gaddis. Grateful to be here with you right now. If you're new, welcome. This podcast is all about relationships, of course, and we help you have better family, friend, partner relationships. Bottom line. And if you're returning, thanks for being here again. Uh, It seems like we have a great loyal following here, and I just want to appreciate all of you who have left us reviews on Apple Podcasts. So cool. That helps us reach more people, believe it or not. Um, Got a good one from Driving Horses, who says, it's impossible to describe my gratitude for the benefit, joy, knowledge, and tools for relational living that Jason brings to my life in this podcast. Through his guests and personal sharing around the commitment to long-term loving relationship, I now have a dynamic set of trails to follow. I have a newfound passion for life and love that I never thought would be possible. Wow, it's so cool. And you go on and on and say a bunch of cool stuff. Thanks. Ten stars. Nice. (laughs) Okay. If you'd be so kind to leave us reviews if you haven't and you're getting value. Thanks so much. Yeah. So in this episode, um, you know, I do a variety of interviews that are you know, a little alternative. And this one is no exception. I've got the um, founder of MAPS on this episode. MAPS is the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, Rick Doblin. So he's the founder and executive director of MAPS. He received his doctorate in public policy from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, where he wrote his dissertation on the regulation of medical uses of psychedelics and marijuana, and his master's thesis on a survey of oncologists about smoked marijuana versus the oral THC pill in nausea control for cancer patients. Okay, this guy is um, an unbelievable trailblazer in the realm of psychedelic research and getting psychedelics into mainstream culture so that we can heal our trauma through psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. So we get into this conversation at length, particularly around MDMA, but we cover ayahuasca, we cover LSD, we cover psilocybin. I share a couple of vignettes from my own psychedelic experiences. Um, Rick has uh, kids, he's married. Uh, We talk about his marriage and and his children and and his psychedelic sort of uh, advice, I guess, for parents at the end, which is really interesting. And um, he studied with Dr. Stan Groff, who many of you might know as the guy who um, kind of birthed uh, holotropic breathwork. And that came out of being shut down around doing psychedelic, uh, particularly LSD psychotherapy. Um, people came in and said, no, you can't do that. So he created holotropic breathwork, which if you've ever done that, I highly recommend it. It's an incredible way to access your unconscious and um, also historic memory in your body, and then be able to process it afterwards with assisted care. So, uh, you know, some of you know that I I have a fair amount of experience with psychedelics over the course of many years, and I'm a big fan uh, in terms of the resurgence and what's going on uh, in terms of our ability to heal trauma, in particularly with the assistance of psychedelics. So, This interview is coming from the lens of how do we heal trauma most effectively and efficiently, and relational trauma is often what's going on. So I thought it'd be fun to to have Rick on the show. So I think you're going to dig this. Uh, It's certainly interesting, and I hope you enjoy it. And stay tuned to the end, as always, for your action step. Welcome to the show, Rick Doblin. Yes, thank you very much, Jason. I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, man. Uh, me too. So, uh, Rick, uh, I've been following your your work and your trailblazing around um, psychedelics and trauma and psychotherapy for a number of years. And I just want to say thank you for working so hard in the trenches to make all this happen, what's currently happening. Yeah, it's, uh, it's taken a while. Basically, oh, man. it's taken our culture around 50 years since the psychedelic 60s and the backlash to reach this point where we're very um open to it now we're open to both medicalization of psychedelics through science through fda but also through religious use of psychedelics and people are starting to question the drug war more and more so we're even approaching the time where people without a diagnosis can use mdma for couples therapy or so in a legal way so we got a ways to go for that still but uh, yeah. yeah it's really um uh delightful in a way to see the way that culture has changed over these last half a century. 
Yeah. Yeah. So cool. Um, just for the newbie here, um, we're going to talk today about psychedelics and healing and growth and how this might actually positively impact our relationships. Um, since so much, so many of us have relationship injuries and pain, uh, at the hands of other people or in, you know, bad breakups or childhood, intense childhoods. So just to frame the conversation, why, um, why psychedelics, why has psychedelics been your life mission and why does it matter when it comes to relationships? Like what's the point? Hmm. Okay. Well, um, yeah, it'll be sort of two interrelated, uh, questions. So why psychedelics? Um, it was really 1972 when I was 18 years old that I felt like I would devote myself to psychedelics, to my own therapy, to um, becoming a psychedelic therapist, bringing back psychedelic research. The reason was political. And I had grown up in ways that were um, very protected, you know, America at its strongest. But I was educated about extraordinarily traumatic situations, about um the Holocaust and the whole dehumanization, mass murder, um, about uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, where that was a big thing when I was growing up. This idea of just uh, the whole world could be destroyed and duck under your desk, duck and cover, which I must say was not that reassuring. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, it's, you know, kids these days get shooter drills, which is terrifying for them when we know that. But then you get a drill when you're young and it's like, well, the whole world could blow up at it nuclear explosion, nuclear war, it's, you know, people don't quite understand when you take that seriously, what that does to your sense of what the world is like. Um, yeah. And for me, the Vietnam War and being a draft resistor and studying nonviolent resistance. And so all of that led me to think of um, psychological factors and, and why we could be uh, destroying ourselves as a species and also as subgroups. Um, Einstein said that our technology has exceeded our humanity. And so I believed all the stuff as I was growing up about the dangers of psychedelics. I believe that if you took um, LSD uh, five or six times, you were certifiably insane for the rest totally, of Totally, I heard that rumor many times, yep. Yeah, you know, I believe that it caused chromosome damage. I believed that you would have deformed babies. I, I believed all this stuff. Um, but over time, I started questioning that. And then when I first started trying psychedelics and had intimations of um, being connected to a deeper reality, that, that it wasn't just me isolated from birth to death and you know trapped in my own head, it was um, this enormous progress that had been made over billions of years to bring us to this point and that I was part of it all and we're all part of it all. And, and, and then I, I recognized the political implications of this kind of mystical sense of unity. That if you feel that, then you realize that we have more in common than different than other people. And so it's harder to dehumanize others. Mm -hmm. It's harder to commit genocide. It's harder to be racist. It's harder to think, uh, let's wipe out all the Russians or, or whatever. So it was out of despair because it was 1972 was after the crackdown. Uh, the backlash against the 60s. Nixon is saying that uh, the war on drugs, we got to escalate. Timothy Leary is the most dangerous man in America. And, right. and it, it's sort of the idealism and the hope of the 60s had crashed and burned. And with it, the psychedelics were thrown under the bus and they were blocked uh, from even being scientifically studied, not in just the US, but all over the world. And so it was 72 that I really started undoing my programming and realizing the potential of psychedelics for me, for society, for, for other people. <clears throat> and so I just thought that um, as part of a strat a revolutionary strategy, you could say, to try to make the world a better place, that um, a bunch of people should be looking at psychedelics and try to bring them back because they're not automatically inherently mystical or spiritual or therapeutic, but when used wisely, they can be. So yeah. it was for political reasons, that really, that I um, decided to focus on psychedelics. The, the other part of it was there's a uh, researcher, Stanislav Grof, who's 89 years old now. Oh, yeah. Czech psychiatrist, um, leading LSD researcher. He helped start transpersonal psychology. He's just a, an incredible man. For those people that are interested, he just summed his life work up in two volume, The Way of the Psychonaut. Oh, wow. Ideas for inner journal journeys which map sells oh, maps.org at our website you could see about his book but yeah we studied him in grad school by the way oh. at naropa i went to naropa so uh, yeah yeah and, and actually right this moment we're doing a training of therapists through naropa 
with oh, cool. uh, Marcella and Bruce, who are uh, living in Boulder. One of yeah. our therapists have worked. We have an uh, alliance with Naropa. Yep. Because it's controversial, they opened it up to their alums, not just their current students. Oh, cool. They got loads of them to uh, apply. And um, I'll also just mention that um, I was um, ended up uh, spending a fair amount of time with uh, Zalman, Rebbe Zalman Schachter, who was a... Yeah, oh, yeah Rebbe Zalman. Legend. I gave him his first MDMA experience. Oh, wow. <laughs> he was amazing. He, he declared uh, uh, MDMA was like the Sabbath. Uh-huh. Uh, like a time out of time, a delight. It, it was pretty great. So um, what, what really did it, in addition to the sense of politics, of uh, the, the value of the mystical experience, was also I had a difficult LSD trips and masculine trips. And I went to the guidance counselor at my college when I was 18. Um, and I said, help me with my LSD trips. And I was, was so lucky. I managed to get somebody who was sympathetic, mm-hmm. thought it was an important pursuit. And not only that, he was in touch with Stan Groff, and he gave me Stan's book, oh my which, God. which was Realms of the Human Unconscious, Observations from LSD Research, which is Stan's first book. And what makes it even more amazing is the book wasn't published until 1975. Hmm. So the guidance counselor had a manuscript copy of it, and he, had, he was in touch with Stan. So after I read this book, I was able to write to Stan, and Stan actually wrote me back. Wow. And I went to a workshop with Stan and Joan Halifax in the summer of 1972. Man, amazing. That's incredible. But, but the thing about Stan's book was that it did talk about the mystical experience, the sense of uh, unity connection. And it did so, though, in a scientific framework. I'm very suspicious about religious dogma, religious traditions that... Um, yeah, just to give you one example. Um, I'm Jewish, and probably a lot of people know that... Um, the way Judaism goes, at least according to the Orthodox, is if your mother's Jewish, you're Jewish. If your father, doesn't matter what your father is. It's all about your mother. Um, and the Orthodox, um, you know, believe that. That's what it means to um, be Jewish in their eyes. But that's not the way it was in the Bible. The Bible, it was your father. It was, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was all about the fathers. And around the year 1000, the rabbis changed it to be the mother because Jews were in exile. Rape was a weapon of war. If you have all these uh, fathers that are not Jewish, that are raping all these Jewish women, and then their babies aren't Jewish, that's a great way to destroy the culture. Hmm. So they switched it so that now it's the religion of your mother. You know, we mm-hmm. can always tell who the mother is. And if she's Jewish or Jewish, doesn't matter about the father. So people have these ideas that, that certain kind of religious uh, systems and dogmas are, you know, unchangeable but but that's not the case so stan was looking at a um, mystical experiences from a cross-cultural scientific perspective and more importantly than even that he was talking about psychotherapy and so everything was put to a reality test of can we help people actually get better in their lives overcome depression anxiety ptsd fear of death um, lack of meaning and purpose and so I felt that it was uh, mysticism with a reality check, mm-hmm. which was this therapy thing. So it was both helping people see the world more accurately as it really is through our own filters that can be warped by trauma and pain and prejudice and just our, our childhood upbringing. Um, and it was this uh, political impact of the mystical experience. So, Powerful. so that, that's why. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and it, obviously it's evolved a lot, which we'll talk about, but um, delineate for the listener just the which might seem obvious to some of us, but um, like when I was in college uh, and I sort of to front load that is just the difference between like a, a trip and just having fun versus actually a facilitated yeah. holding environment that's where a transformation can occur in a safe place. Right. So w- my yeah. first time with MDMA was in college and it was a really positive experience uh, and it was wonderful, but I had no, you know, there was just partying basically. It was ecstasy, right? Let's take some ecstasy, dude. We had a few beers. It was a fun night. And then when I did LSD um, and psilocybin, those were two totally different monsters for me. And I had no way to integrate the experience. I had what, what you called kind of bad trips. Yeah. It very much scared me. And um, right, there's a big difference between that type of use and facilitated use. Will you just talk for the listener about the the big yeah, sure. So, so the first thing that's the difference is that the way you described it is let's just have fun. Yeah. 
And so when you have that mindset, I'm just going to take these drugs to have fun. A lot of times um, things come up that are difficult. Um, you know, Stan Groff says that uh, LSD is a nonspecific amplifier of the unconscious. Mm. You know, MDMA is more loving, more it, it yeah. releases oxytocin. The, yeah, the amygdala uh, goes offline. and Yeah. yeah. It, it's more reliably um, open-hearted, loving connection. But LSD, psilocybin, they're nonspecific amplifiers of the unconscious. And so if difficult stuff comes up that's emotionally charged, it will come up. And if your mindset is, I only want to have fun, and oh, now this is getting <laughs> difficult, and then you try to stuff those feelings down, you could be worse off for yeah, a you're going to have a bad year. experience. Yeah. Yeah. What we do say in our Zendo psychedelic harm reduction program, which is actually led by, was led by um, Sarah Gale from Boulder also, mm -hmm. um, the, the main things we say are first off, uh, create a safe space. So that's very important that, that you feel safe, that you feel. Uh, protected. It's it's easier to be protected if you have somebody there that you're not just doing it with a bunch of people that are all dripping and you know you've got nobody to be the intermediary between you and the outside reality or to protect you all. So uh, the other part is sitting, not guiding, in the sense that we believe that there's a innate healing mechanism of the psyche. And once you take these psychedelic drugs, um, even in your dreams, we can say that things emerge in your dreams, and we need to, we follow them. We, we support people to experience whatever they are. So we're, we're not doing guided imagery. We're not, we don't know all the yeah. psychodynamics for the individual. Also, we say that um, talk through, not talk down. And so this gets to be the difference when recreational and therapeutic mm -hmm. is that when somebody has a difficult experience, when a bunch of people are just out to party, people are like, hey, don't care about it. Don't, you know, don't pay attention. Let's just laugh and, you know, think about butterflies and rainbows and, you know, whatever. And when you try to talk somebody down from a difficult trip, um, you're not dealing with the difficult material. You need yeah. to talk through it. You need to help people work through it. And that way they can actually make enduring progress with their emotional dynamics. Mm. And the final thing that we say is that uh, difficult is not the same as bad. Mm -hmm. So nice. in the situation that you described, when difficult stuff comes, you're thinking, I'm just not here to party. Oh, now it's getting difficult. That's bad. I got a bad trip. I better shut this down or yeah. do something, drink some. You know, we also don't give MDMA or LSD or psilocybin after alcohol. That kind of mutes it as well. Yep. Um, so I, I think the dangers of recreational use are that people approach it too casually. They only want to have one slice of the emotional range. Pleasure without pain. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you could end up worse off. And when you do encounter difficult stuff, um, there, there's a great book about PTSD by a fellow named Bessel van der Kolk, And the book is uh, The Body yeah. Keeps the Score. Yeah. He's been on the podcast before. Yep. Oh, good. Good. Yeah. yeah. So he's the principal investigator of our Boston site here. Nice. So uh, for MDMA research, and he happens to think MDMA is incredible potential for PTSD. But a lot of times difficult stuff doesn't just come up in your awareness with a story and the memories. A lot of times when it's particularly difficult, it comes up in body sensations. Mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of people talking about somatic therapy. Yeah. Um, and so you need somebody ideally that's, that's knowledgeable to help in this emergence process. Um, just to give you one quick example. Um, I was sitting for somebody who was a German doctor. Um, this was now 1984. And um, his arm became paralyzed under the influence of MDMA. Mm -hmm. he, he couldn't move it. And, and he was like freaking out. And we're like, look, MDMA is not hurting your nerves. This is something psychomatic, psychosomatic. We don't know what it is. You don't know what it is. But, but let's just, you know, we don't have to take you to the hospital. Let's just like play it out. And over hours and hours came this story and the story was that um, he and his mother and his siblings were around the uh, deathbed of their father. He was in the hospital, kept alive on all these machines, but not really that um, conscious. And they had to decide whether to remove, remove the life support. Mm -hmm. And he was the doctor. He wrote out the order. Um, but the thing that he said to us that was complicating is he hated his father. Yeah. So, so he wasn't sure if he killed his father. And that was sort of the fear that he had, that I wrote this, I killed my father. And, and so that came in this paralysis of his arm that signed the order. All right. Wow. Then over time, he started realizing, no, his mother thought it was the right thing. His siblings thought it the right thing. Um, his father did want that. 
And so once he sort of resolved this unconscious guilt that he had killed his father or the fear that he wasn't able to look at carefully, the feeling came back to his arm. Yeah. And by the end of it, he was fine. So when you do these things in a recreational setting and, and you don't have people that understand the, the way that things can get somaticized or that they need to emerge, you, you can end up um, shutting things down and being worse off for a very long time. Yeah. So it's, absolutely. Yeah. The, the other big thing about the um, difference between therapeutic settings, too, is first off, it's pure drugs. When you're buying stuff on the street, you don't know what it is. Yeah. Could be mixed with all kinds also, of stuff. Also, you have um, informed consent forms in the research. You, you're educated a lot about what it is, about how long yeah. it's going to take. You know, your friends you say, the context, it's clear. Yeah. You know, Maybe you don't even know that there's ecstasy is really MDMA is really different than LSD or psilocybin. Yeah, it, it is fundamentally different in a lot of ways. So, on the other hand, let me just say that there are a bunch of people that take MDMA recreationally and do a lot of good therapeutic work. Sure, but their attitude is more: I'm going to deal with whatever comes up. Um, just as another story, um, this is like 10, 15 years ago. There was um, one week where two women contacted us with almost the identical stories, but different outcomes. They both had taken MDMA at a rape and both had um, memories of uh, sexual abuse and rape come up. Mm -hmm. One of them said, I was with a bunch of friends just to have fun. And uh, I knew they didn't want to hear about anything serious like that. So I stuffed my feelings down and now it's months later and I feel worse. Yep. The other woman said, um, I was with a bunch of people uh, we took these drugs for fun. This memory of this sexual abuse rape came up and I was with a girlfriend though too. And we went off into the corner and I talked to her about what happened. An hour later, I felt a lot better and I went back to the party and now I feel better. Yeah. So wow. you, you can have a lot of progress uh, that people can make in these uh, recreational, I, I tend to call them celebratory experiences. Recreational is kind of diminishes them there. Mm -hmm. somehow rather frivolous and reckless and they're they're just for fun but but they well recreate well, that the, yeah know, they're not. I, I think that's actually an important distinction there recreational versus celebratory because the i think it was the might have been the first or second psilocybin experience i had i was in the utah desert and um i had one of these openings that was profound where i felt connected to everything right but then shortly thereafter i saw myself from a uh, hundred yards or so away. And I, it freaked me out because I was seeing my personality and the, the strategy that I'd created for my life and how it wasn't working. Mm. And I, I got me in touch with how big that gap was and how much pain I was in. And I sent me into qu the quote, bad trip zone uh, only because I was expecting something different. Right. Yeah. But it was super like looking back, it was a pivotal moment in my life. It, it began, it, it kind of punctured the facade of my personality and put me on the path in a stronger way. Wow, that's terrific. Just that's terrific. Yeah. And that's people have those kind of experiences, even even in recreational settings, right? Yeah, oh, for sure. I mean, it's just uh, again, when you say non-specific amplifier of the unconscious, things that are charged will come up. The, the other big difference I would say between therapeutic and recreational or celebratory even is that the recreational celebratory is about what experience do you have while you're under the influence of the drug. Mm -hmm. The therapeutic is about what you bring back from the experience nice. underneath the drug to um, integrate into your baseline, to make your baseline different. different. You're not just trying to have a yep. experience that's, that's a pleasurable experience. You're trying to learn and bring back so that you... So what we find also is that um, after our therapy, which is basically um, three and a half months long, uh, three MDMA experiences once a month interspersed with 12 90-minute non-drug psychotherapy sessions, that at the 12-month follow-up, people keep getting better. So at the two-month follow-up, which is two months after the last MDMA session, um, that's what's called the primary outcome measure. That's where we compare the results from the control group who get therapy without MDMA that's active versus therapy with active MDMA. People do pretty well then. Um, mm -hmm. But at the 12 month follow up, after which, so at the primary outcome measure, we stop having any interventions. They can do what they want, they can add anything. But people are even on average better at the 12 month than at the two month follow up. They've learned how to process trauma right. and pain. And now they can do that on their own without the drug. It's incredible. And that's what the therapy is about is to teach you tools 
during the experience on the drug, they, then you can use without the drug on your yeah. own. And so the, the emphasis is really completely different. It's on changing your baseline and getting you to not need drugs versus, oh, I'm going to have fun. I, every time I have fun, I have more fun with the drug. So I'm going to keep taking this drug every time I have fun. Right. And, and if we talk about the mechanism of MDMA, the way I understand it is MDMA allows the amygdala, which is a big fear um, center in the brain, it sort of takes it offline if we want to simplify it a little bit and allows me to look at my trauma, right? In a safe way where I feel relaxed and my nervous system is calm and I've got a loving presence there being witness and helping me if I need it. And then afterwards, I, I'm left with this sense of, oh, I'm, it's not me. It's, a, it's something that happened to me and I can make meaning of it. And now I can learn how to relate to it different. And with follow-up psychotherapy, for example, I can have a completely different experience. Is that sort of in a nutshell, I mean, in maybe simplistic way, dumbed down way, MDMA yeah, and how it works? That's, yeah, that's a good way to say it. So, um, you know, some of our uh, people in our studies have said, uh, PTSD changed my brain and MDMA changed it back. Hmm. So if you have PTSD, you have a hyperactive amygdala. You, yeah. you're, you're constantly uh, in fear. You're easily triggered by certain memories or certain reminders of the trauma. But also you have reduction of activity in the prefrontal cortex when you have PTSD. Yeah. You, you're no longer as logical. Some sound that um, you're clearly not like for people that were in a battle. Some sound in a city, a uh, car backfire or whatever. Yeah. Things seems like a bomb, but but you know you're not in the middle of a war zone, but but you don't have that logical ability to to sort of have that moment. No, no, I'm I'm not at risk right now. So the um, other other part of it is that um, the trauma experience um, feels to people like it's always happening or about to happen again. You're, you're never able to process it into long term memory. So there's um, sort of reduction of connection between the amygdala and the hippocampus where we store things into long term memory. So that's how um, PTSD changes your brain. MDMA mm -hmm. reduces activity in the amygdala so that your fear response is way um, reduced. Your activity in the prefrontal cortex is increased. Mm -hmm. And the connection between the amygdala and the hippocampus is increased as well. So that you can take these experiences and place them in the past, whereas right. before people have been unable to do that. Also, MDMA stimulates... Uh, oxytocin, which is the hormone of nursing mothers, love and bonding that, that builds therapeutic alliance, builds connection. It releases serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine in some complex cascade. So I think that um, designing a drug for PTSD, you design MDMA. Absolutely. It's really mixes very well with it. And what we've shown too, is that these patterns of fear and trauma that people develop, they can last for decades and decades and decades. I mean, we've had Vietnam vets, though, that under MDMA were able to get over PTSD. Wow. So you can be, I, I think this is basically a message of hope, you know, that, that you can be stuck in this kind of recycled brain patterns based on fear, based on trauma, but that it's not necessarily permanent. There is hope for healing. Yeah. And that, that, that can be done. Um, the, the other thing I just want to say is that um, for people that don't have trauma, you know, it's, it's always um, challenging, um, you know, when we have uh, close, loving relationships, uh, you know, to be uh, a good listener sometimes. You know, everything gets wrapped up into um, our own, um, you know, ego vulnerabilities or, you know, or even... Um, you know, it's it's really sometimes hard to communicate without the emotions getting all wrapped up in it. So MDMA is phenomenal for couples therapy, for relationships, because this, yeah. the, the part that we haven't really, that I haven't really mentioned is this sense of self-acceptance. Mm -hmm. That's another big part of MDMA is this. So the fear goes down, but you accept and love yourself as you are. Right. There's totally. this sense of, okay, you know, all these things are happening, but you know, I'm, I'm lovable as I am. Mm -hmm. So once you have that sense of self-acceptance, you're not so dependent upon your uh, other, the other or the partner, you know, telling you great things about you. You, you can be more open to critical comments, yeah. you can become a better listener. And also you can explain um, what you're feeling um, more fluidly. Mm -hmm. 
because you're not tripping over all these internal like um, fears of rejection or, you know, you know, fears totally. of not, not wanting to uh, accept this part of you or that part of you, this urge or that urge or this fantasy, you know, you're able to be more um, self-acceptance. And so I, I think that the, the challenge for us actually is that one of the very best uses of MDMA is for couples therapy. But because the drugs are illegal, we can only work through the FDA to get drugs approved for um, diseases, mm-hmm. for clinical diagnoses. Right. And so, you know, a difficult relationship in the future, you know, may, may be considered a disease, but it, right now it's not. Yeah. But it's some of the most painful, important things that people have in their lives. Absolutely. And so yeah, we and you, figure out a way to, to get that. And that, that's where you get into this whole drug policy reform. You know, we need to make it so it's available to people legally without them having to go to their doctor or have some religious ceremony and say it's religious freedom. Okay, quick interruption from yours truly. How would you rate your conflict skills with the most important people in your life? Do you withhold the truth? Do you Are you able to get to zero every time and work through the stuff and get back to a good place? Or is it challenging? Uh, if you're normal, it's probably challenging. So I want you to consider coming to our relationship workshop on conflict called Accepted and Connected, because that's what you feel on the other side of conflict, if you know how to work through it. All right. So here's what uh, one of our um, European students had to say. Check it out. I'm Alexander. I always wanted to do the in-person event, but I couldn't travel to USA. And now being it online, I immediately jumped on the opportunity to, to take part at it. I got clarity about how I operate when I'm under stress because I shut down my communication with people around me and simultaneously my expectations in their regard rises, but not communicating. Um, We fall apart and I resent them. So what I got out of this is that I need to speak up when I get under stress and even ask for help and name it that I'm uh, in trouble so that they know what is going on and what is what is happening. So doing the work and learning and practicing the tools. And what I noticed is that not only my marriage um, improved, I noticed that I have relationships all around me. Uh, let it be with my daughter, uh, let it be we're on the workplace and I'm using the same tools in all of these relationships and I, I see I see that I can really feel and see the difference. There you have it from Alexander, who had an amazing experience. He's been studying with us for a while. Thanks, Alexander. Uh, come check us out again, guys. Relationshipschool.com forward slash connected and back to the podcast. You were talking before we hit record about this that there are experimental studies right now underway with the VA. Can you, can you say more about that? Uh, yeah. With so, couples? Uh, we have uh, tried since 1990 to sponsor research inside the VA. Right now, just to give you an example of the problem that they face, there's over a million vets uh, disabled with PTSD. Not all of them, 100%. But um, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of $15 billion a year that the VA pays on disability payments. Wow. 15 billion a year. And these are mostly younger people. And so this is going to be going on for 40 years more. So you would think that the VA would want to pay for new treatments for PTSD, would pay to develop them. But but so far, we haven't got a penny from the VA. Um, What happened about um, 11 years ago is that I got in touch with Richard Rockefeller, who was a doctor. David Rockefeller was his father. He was chair of the board of advisors of Doctors Without Borders. And he was involved in Kosovo and Serbia and saw massive numbers of refugees, all with PTSD. And he didn't know how to help them. And, and so we started talking about um, MDMA. And he said, what's your biggest problem? And I said, it's the VA and the Department of Defense. Now, you know, They should be interested in this. We're trying to get them interested, but they just won't listen because of the stigma of psychedelics. Conveniently, his cousin was Senator Jay Rockefeller from West Virginia, 
mm-hmm. of the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee. So we had a whole series of meetings up and down the Pentagon, all the way up to the Secretary of the Navy, the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs, various admirals, Navy psychiatrists, all, all this kind of stuff. And then we went through the VA up to the level of the Secretary of the VA, all this mediated by Senator Rock. So we finally had this meeting, and now this is about, um, uh, right now it's about uh, six and a half years ago. And it was with the, the Department of Defense and the VA. And what they finally were able to say to us is that um, they would let one of their researchers work with us. We had to pay for it. Mm-hmm. They had to use their academic affiliations, not their VA affiliations. And the people who were in the study had to come from outside the VA. And the one therapy that they thought we should start with was this woman named Candace Monson, who had, had been in charge of women's health at the Boston VA. And she had developed an approach to treating PTSD called cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy. Conjoint okay. means couples or dyads. Mm-hmm. So it's about treating the person with PTSD. But through, it, couple, through couples work. Through couples work, yes, because yeah. it affects the relationship. And they're also Thank looking God. at helping the person who's got the stress from having a partner that got PTSD. Mm-hmm. So there's all sorts of measures of the strength of the relationship, of how they communicate, communication styles, and things like that. Um, And so, you know, the the people at the uh, Department of Defense and the VA had heard about, you know, MDMA is the love drug. And they thought, okay, let's just do this couples therapy thing. So we then did this um, project with Candace and Ann Wagner, who was one of her protégés, with our lead psychiatrist and his wife, Michael and Annie Mithofer, who are a co-therapy team. And we did six dyads where both members of the couple, the one that had the PTSD and the the relationship, both got MDMA. And so this was called a treatment development, an open label. It was no double blind, open label treatment development study to look at how we might blend MDMA with cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy. Now, cognitive behavioral therapy, cognitive processing therapy, prolonged exposure, these different therapies for PTSD are highly scripted. You know, they're manualized, they're scripted. Here's what you do on the first meeting. Here's the second meeting. Here's your learning objectives. Here's your exercises. Here's your homework, all this kind of stuff. So what it evolved, though, is that the exercises for cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy were used more in the preparation sessions or in the Mm -hmm. tail end of the MDMA session. But the MDMA session itself looked more and more like the way we did it, open-ended, supportive, non-interdirected from the people that are coming up you know, expression of symptoms rather than suppression of symptoms. Yeah. You know, if somebody had body pains, you'd encourage them to express it or to, to rock, cry or rock or, or whatever they're doing. And it turned out to be a, a great way to sort of back into studying MDMA for a couple therapy. Yeah. And so about two months ago, Candace and I presented the results of our phase. I presented the results of our phase two and phase three research with MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD to try to make it into a prescription medicine. And then Candace presented the results of this blending MDMA with cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy. And she showed all of the studies that she did to develop the technique. And she showed what's called the effect size. So many people know about statistical significance. It's, you know, is something more likely to be by chance or by something that you're trying to study? And if something Mm -hmm. is a one in 20 chance of being by chance, it's called statistically significant. And the more people you have in a study, the easier it is to find statistical significance from smaller and smaller changes. Mm -hmm. Um, But these changes might not be um, clinically significant. You could have statistically significant uh, changes, but they're clinically very minor. So a new measure has been developed called effect size, which is the strength, the magnitude of the effect. It's sort of indirectly related to uh, statistical significance. So Candace presented all of the effect sizes from all of the studies of cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy without MDMA. And then she presented the effect size when you blend MDMA with it. And it was better than any study that she'd ever done before. (laughs) Of course. And so now she wants to do a larger study that would really um, look more closely with a control group and, and many other dyads to look at. Uh, blending MDMA with cognitive behavior. The, the important thing to say here too is that Candace is now president of the International Society of Traumatic Stress Studies, mm. the largest organization of PTSD therapists and researchers in the world. Well, wow. he's now the president of it. So we are making a lot of progress with the mainstreaming 
um, MDMA assisted psychotherapy for PTSD and psychedelic psychotherapy in general. That's so cool. And and how far, Rick, are we out from, I know we're, are we in phase three clinical trials of yeah. MDMA? Yeah. All right. So um, it took us 30 years from the start of uh, MAPS in 1986 to um, November 29th, 2016, 30 and a half years to get to the place where we went to FDA and we said we would like to have an end of phase two meeting. So phase one is safety studies. Phase two is your small pilot studies, developing your approach. Who's your best patients? What's your inclusion exclusion criteria? What's your doses? What's your you know, treatment method? All these things. So um, we got permission to go to phase three after 30 years of work. Um, then we negotiated eight months about with FDA about how to design the phase three studies and what else they would want to see, what other data. Then FDA declared MDMA a breakthrough therapy for PTSD, meaning it's among the most promising treatments for a drug for whom for a disease for which um, many people are not sufficiently healed from the currently yeah. available medications and psychotherapies. Yeah, uh, it took us a bunch to, of time to raise a bunch more money. Now we've raised over a hundred million dollars in donations in the history of MAPS. Dude, congratulations! Um, by the way, astonishing amount of money. It's yeah. Shattered your goal there of thirty million. Yeah, uh, well, that was over you know thirty um, four years. Okay. So, yeah. Right, but but then we started in two thousand eighteen. We started phase. Um, and so what we had in March of uh, 2020 was what's called the interim analysis. Um, you can take a sneak peek at your data, not you, but your independent data monitoring committee. And they look at the unblinded data. And there's only a few people on this committee. And then they tell the sponsor several different things. They, the only thing that you get is a number. They don't tell you the data. They don't tell you who's who. You have to wait till the study is finished. But the interim analysis, we agreed with FDA we would do two 100-person phase three studies. Okay. The interim analysis is done when 60% have, or 60 people had their primary outcome measure and the other 40 were enrolled. Okay. All right. So the purpose of the interim analysis is to give you the advice, do you need to add more people to get statistical significance? So the, the, the Independent Data Monitoring Committee compares your actuals with your hypotheticals that you mm -hmm. use to size the study and do your statistical power calculations, which we, the hypotheticals were based on our phase two data. And so this interim analysis uh, in March will tell, told me either you don't need to add anybody, which is what we wanted, or you need to add a certain number of people, which means our effect size would have been less than we had predicted, yep. or just give it up. It's, it's futile. It's not working. No matter how many people you add, stop the study. There's only one other drug that the FDA declared a breakthrough therapy for PTSD, which was called Tanmaya by Tonics Pharmaceuticals. And that drug was um, had their interim analysis in February 2020. And they were told to give up the study. It's futile. It's not working. And they spent well over $100 million on it. So we're the only breakthrough therapy for PTSD still standing. And so in March... Mm -hmm. We were told, don't add anybody. It's going great. You've got a 90% or greater probability of success and at at least a medium effect size. Now, okay. that's right around the time COVID hit and we got uh, lockdowns and shutdowns. And so research wasn't happening anymore for a while. So FDA contacted not just us, but other sponsors of research that were well underway. And they said, we would be willing to negotiate with you to end the study early. And so that's a little bit of a concern because the fewer people you have in your study, the less likely you are to get statistical significance. Uh huh. Right. But not having enough people in your study, you know, and then everybody's worried that it's it, now it's a different world. Everybody's more anxious because of PTSD, uh, because of COVID. I mean, you know, uh, compounded with their PTSD, uh, economic problems. You know, so we negotiated with FDA that we would end the study with ninety people instead of a hundred. The last data point we got was in August. And so in about three weeks, we're going to know whether our first study was statistically significant, wow. which means that whether it's successful or not. We have started enrolling in our second phase three study. So I just want to say to those people that are listening that may either have PTSD or knows people that have PTSD, you go to clinicaltrials.gov. And you put in MDMA and PTSD, and it'll lead to our study. There's a couple mm. studies that have been completed. I think ours, I checked earlier, was like number 17 or so of the 18 studies that have been uh, listed there. 
And that'll tell you all the sites that the studies are taking place, whether they're open okay. for screening or not. So people could volunteer if they have PTSD and it's completely free. And um, now yeah. half the people get the control group. Right. But the way we've set it up is that once the study is all over, those people that were in the control group can go through it again for free and get uh, therapy with MDMA, whereas wow. they got therapy with placebo. That's generous of you guys. That's cool. Well, we, we think, first off, it's useful to us, the data, you know. Yeah. But also, it, it's to help uh, enroll and recruit subjects, help help them not drop out, to know if they finish when it's over, they can get MDMA. And it, it's also going to be, um, it's, it was important that we have a control group because we want to see what are the safety problems coming from just treating people with PTSD. Because we worked the hard cases. Yeah. And unlike a lot of studies, we let in people that have previously attempted suicide. Mm-hmm. Um, they can't be actively suicidal, but but if they've attempted suicide in the past, they're they're welcome. Why exclude those people that need it the most? Yeah, totally. So, are we talking twenty twenty one or twenty twenty two when this could actually be in a psychotherapist's office after they get trained? Well, the the other part is that we've negotiated with FDA for uh, what's called expanded access, which is compassionate use, which runs concurrent with phase three. You can't slow down phase three. So we've actually got approval for 50 patients for expanded access, and we've set up 10 sites that are not in the cities where we have phase three. So in 2021, expanded access is going to happen. That's where people can pay for their own treatment. It's in the clinics can provide it. Um, We are gathering funding from various people to subsidize some of the costs, particularly for veterans or um, um, uh, minority groups that have PTSD. Um, so I, I encourage people to go to the, um, clinicaltrials.gov and, and you can check out over time, which of our, um, expanded access sites open, but that's a small limited thing. Your cool. question was really, when is it available by percentage? Yeah. So, um, we think now it depends on COVID, but we think by 2022, we will be able to, uh, hopefully the first half of 2022, um, you know, less than two years from now, present all the data to FDA. And we hope by the end of 2022 or early 2023 that the FDA will approve for prescription use, assuming our data justifies it. Dang, and now we're cool. trying to start research in Europe as well. We're just starting with multiple different, um, in seven different countries, 10 sites in seven different countries. We're training the European therapists. We're moving forward on that. Um, we think if we do raise the money for Europe, we have to raise another 30 million for Europe and globalization. Um, but then we think Europe will be the end of 2023, uh, early 2024. Okay. Wow. So amazing. Now, uh, just because there's, there's um, limited time left, I, I'd love to ask you about sort of psychedelic yeah. psychotherapy. Um, sure. MDMA is te- technically not a psychedelic, right? Well, it depends technically. Um, the word psychedelic means mind manifesting. Okay. So the way that MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, the way we define psychedelic is the original meaning of the word, which is mind manifesting. So mm-hmm. your dreams are psychedelic. Mm-hmm. Um, holotropic breathwork, hyperventilation is psychedelic. There's a lot of diff- going in a flotation tank. Can be ketamine, psychedelic. Ketamine, you know. um, but the, the thing that you're pointing to is that MDMA is not like the classic psychedelics. MDMA yeah. is fundamentally different than um, LSD, psilocybin, um, ayahuasca, mescaline, ibogaine. DMT, you yeah. know, um, these are these are all kind of ego dissolving drugs, um, and MDMA doesn't do that in that same way. Yeah. Uh, it's more this fear reduction, this open heartedness. People do have spiritual experiences on MDMA, but um, yeah, some people say back in the eighties when the DEA was trying to criminalize MDMA, um, we tried to say, oh, it's not like all these other psychedelics; it's an empathogen that promotes empathy or an intactogen that helps you touch within. We tried to make the claim that it's a different thing. Um, it, it uh, Ultimately, uh, it did not succeed. And uh, it, MDMA was criminalized in 1985 by the DEA. But but I, I think that the the, um, the thing that you're pointing to really is it is different than a classic psychedelic. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, I'm just, for the listener here, I, and I, I think I want to um, zero in on, a, on the facilitation again of it. So... There's um, obviously in certain circles, you can find someone to maybe facilitate you while doing LSD 
or while doing psilocybin or while doing ayahuasca. Sometimes they happen in group settings. Sometimes there's a combination. Sometimes there's synthetic things. You know, I live in Boulder where these people move through town and it's kind of a mystery how to, who do, who do you get connected with? And um, what are just some, um, I guess, benefits to uh, say LSD or psilocybin versus MDMA? Yeah, well, what we're trying to do is legitimize an entire field of psychedelic psychotherapy. Absolutely. So that the therapists are going to be cross-trained, which with MDMA, with ketamine, with psilocybin, with LSD. Uh, and so I think when people are um, traumatized, it's good to begin with MDMA. You know, that, that mm-hmm. um, when these drugs that are ego-dissolving um, act on you. And then as Stan said, LSD non-specific amplifier, the unconscious, th- those traumas are going to be near the surface because that's what it means to have PTSD and they're going to emerge, but there's no big fear reduction. So a- actually, let me show you this for those people. So um, this is called Shaviti, um, a vision. Okay. Um, this is an incredible book. This is the first time that ever a psychedelic was used for PTSD. It was a Dutch psychiatrist, Dr. Bastians. And he did this in the 50s, 60s, 70s. He was the last person in the world, still into the 80s, that had permission to give LSD to people. And what he did was LSD for concentration camp syndrome. These were people that are in the concentration camps. Shabidi is about an Israeli who survived the concentration camps, became a Holocaust writer, went for LSD treatment and writes about his LSD treatment. Wow. So what you see, the big difference is with the classic psychedelics is they don't reduce the fear. These experiences are very, very difficult. My Israeli relatives knew him before and after and said it helped them a lot, but he he still had a lot of suffering. Um, and, And just taking MDMA doesn't mean the suffering goes away. It just means that you can put it in the background instead of the foreground. Mm hmm. Um, So I think that uh, we will start with uh, MDMA um, for PTSD. Other things too, I think um, MDMA is more relational. You know, you're you're more ego intact. So MDMA for couples therapy, um, I think it's going to be better than LSD or psilocybin for couples therapy. Um, You know, for facing death, um, we've done a study with uh, people with life-threatening illnesses with anxiety and depression with MDMA. Other people have done studies with psilocybin, and um, th- they all help. I mean, there's something about this ego dissolution that, that helps you sometimes get a different perspective on death yeah. and make your peace with it. Totally. So, Did me. Yeah. yeah. So I think what will happen in the future is that when people go to these psychedelic clinics, um, they will probably start with MDMA. That may be all, all that they need. Sometimes just for a different kind of experience, maybe they'll move to LSD or psilocybin. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, LSD and psilocybin are doing pretty w- really well for um, depression, for addiction. Um, a lot, a lot of things about addiction too are that you know, people feel isolated and they have traumas and they um, escape in drugs. Yeah. So we, there was just a study done in England by a Dr. Ben Sessa, which was uh, MDMA for alcoholics, and the theory was you reduce the trauma, you reduce their need to escape in alcohol, and and he's now doing long-term follow-ups. He's got great results. Yeah. Psilocybin and, and, yeah. and ayahuasca and even uh, Ibogaine for opiate addiction. So I, th- I think that what we want to do is empower therapists, cross train them with all the different drugs, and then have them develop an individualized, uh, personalized medicine mm-hmm. and, and use a sequence of experiences. The, the other um, people thing that people need to keep in mind is that in the fifties and sixties with LSD, and the psilocybin research. And in the modern research with LSD and psilocybin in the last 20 years, there's been a similar finding, you know, 50 years apart, you could say, which is that the depth of the mystical experience is correlated with therapeutic outcomes. The more you have this ego dissolution, the more you feel this sense of uh, connection and unity, the more oneness, yeah. things, uh, the oneness, the more things come up to the surface that you try to process. The depth of the mystical experience is correlated with therapeutic outcome for the classic psychedelics. However, for MDMA, for PTSD, we use the exact same questionnaire, the mystical experience questionnaire. People do score remarkably high, but there is no correlation between Mm -hmm. mystical experience and healing from PTSD in our MDMA group. It's more about being intact with your ego and having these memories come up that happen to you or 
sometimes, you know, symbolic uh, multi-generational traumas. But yeah. still, you're, you're sort of there to experience it and to process it. And you're moving these memories that have the, uh, so there's episodic memory about what happened. And then there's the emotional memory that gets attached to it. Mm-hmm. And so you can actually rewrite the way these memories are stored in your brain so that you can, we find under MDMA, people's memory for the trauma is increased, but they swap out this memory that it's always happening yeah. right now or that it's super painful. Once you've processed it, then it's like, okay, that was part of my life. As you said before, you know, it's in the past. So I think that's an important distinction uh, between the way MDMA and classic psychedelics work. And therefore in our MDMA experiences, we're not trying to um, move people in the direction of mystical experience. Totally support whatever happens. The the other thing that's important is that we have a male female co-therapy team. That's our standard model. Mm-hmm. So we use a two-person team, not a one-person team. Mm-hmm. People are very vulnerable under the influence of psychedelics. When there's a two-person team, they'll feel safer. Yeah. If it was a woman that had been raped and have just a male therapist, that might be more difficult than also having a woman. In front. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of times people don't think men, you know, that they can't let out their emotions, that that's somehow weak. Having a woman in the room somehow makes that easier sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's both for efficacy and safety that we have a two-person team. They're not always male, female. Sometimes we have two women, sometimes two men, sometimes people who don't identify with any gender, but where we want to end up is um, one of them is a trained therapist. The other is an apprentice working for free to get their license. Yeah. Certain hours. So we want to keep the two person team. And I think that that can be uh, very important if we can manage to do that. And we also have eight hour sessions. I mean, that's another difference is that you can be very patient about people coming around to the trauma when it's an eight hour session in their yeah. own way with their own, uh, you know, sometimes they go to happy memories that give them strength to then go into a painful memory. Yeah. Sometimes they go straight to the trauma, but we don't push them. And it's much different than a 45 or 50 minute hour that you have for therapy with someone, Totally. Um, you know, where you got to get down to the point and that's where you have all these exercises. So we think though, that it's initially more expensive because it's more therapy time, but it will be cost effective because it's more effective and it's durable, and people keep getting better on their own. So cool. Rick, I'm appreciating your kind of relational sensitivity in all your psychedelic experience, and I'm curious um, where that comes from in you, and I'm also curious if if your marriage influenced, Mm -hmm. you know, being married for so long influences uh, your relational sensitivity to to sort of the healing journey. Yeah, I think so. Well, first off, my wife and I like to try to do MDMA together once a year. It's it's been tremendously helpful. you know, to have a long-term relationship, um, you know, it just makes it easier to listen and to say things. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I did notice a little mistake I was making a couple of years. Now we've been now um, um, married for 27 years. Um, And so there was a period, I'd say maybe 10 years ago, where I was waiting for the MDMA experience to have difficult conversations. (laughs) Right. And and so I realized that's a total cop-out. I mean, the whole idea is that you should be getting better and better at having difficult experiences without the MDMA. Uh-huh. And totally. that's like up and wait for the MDMA. So I, I did notice that uh, mistake. That's pretty there. common. I mean, people do that with therapy or yeah, anything really. Yeah. 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 But that was a yeah, comment. I, I realized that. But but right. I, I think that um this um you know r- yeah, being in a long-term relationship is really helpful for those kind of understandings. And um I, I think this other part of it though was really just this uh you know, the training that I've had with Stan Groff in the holotropic breath work and in this whole approach, my, my understanding that I'd say one of the mistakes of the sixties actually to get this was this idea that it's a one dose miracle cure psychedelics. Yeah. Right. And, and so that put all the power in the psychedelics. Yeah. You know, one dose not in someone's cure, hands, not in the relationship that you have with it. And so I'd say the fundamental problem with our drug war too, is that we've ascribed drugs have certain powers. These are good drugs. These are bad drugs. These are legal. These are illegal. The drugs are the problem when really it's the relationship. And so that's why we need to new, move to a whole new drug policy with uh, legal access to these drugs and focus on the relationship because even psychedelics are just tools. They can, mm-hmm. you know, we talked about with recreational, they can be harmful. But if you see the psychedelics as a tool that can be used wisely or can be used poorly, that it's the relationship you establish with it is the most important thing. Mm-hmm. Um, totally. The best the best example of that with FDA, just by the way, and I'll be super quick because I know we're running out of time, is thalidomide. Thalidomide was the quintessential bad drug. It was used by women for morning sickness. 
Um, it caused birth defects, terrible birth defects of short limbs. And um, mm. the, the only woman, the, the only person at the FDA that ever won the Presidential Medal of Honor was a woman named Frances Kelsey who blocked thalidomide from coming into the U.S. It was approved in Europe. And she just wasn't comfortable with the safety. And then she got this Presidential Medal of Honor. Uh, decade or so, uh, two decades later, thalidomide is now a medicine accepted by the FDA for a certain kind of cancer and leprosy. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole host of procedures to make sure that it never ends up in a pregnant woman. Uh, Patient registries, yeah. pharmacist education, but, but that just emphasizes that if the relationship you have with the drug that matters, this was used in a way that caused horrific birth defects, but now it's a medicine helping save people's lives. And it's the so same drug. So cool. Two last questions. Um, one is, you know, I, I participated in a number of ayahuasca ceremonies over the years, and that's a medicine where it seems like in a traditional setting, it's like you're really supposed to just be with the medicine, and be with yourself, yeah. right? With like kind of very little, any kind of facilitation before, after, or during. And I see more and more people, and over the years of being in these communities, I saw more and more people get a little blown out. And um, I'm just curious if you, if you see that and, and if there's a, a much kind of better way to use that medicine for a Westerner, especially um, because I, I see the lack of integration, I, I would have these mad, amazing mystical experiences. And then days later I'd be depressed and I couldn't integrate it. And I was on my own. Right. Um, yeah. So I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that. Yeah. Well, one of the most important things that we need to explore is going to be group therapy. You know, and, and how do we do that? So the, we actually were trying a bunch of uh, people with PTSD do go down to um, South America for ayahuasca for PTSD. And so we, we tried to work with the churches in the U.S., the Unao de Vegetal and the Santo Daime that are legal, and say, could we um, do observational study of PTSD patients coming to your services? And then we'd watch them before and after. And what the UDV said is, no, you can't do that because it's all about the spiritual experience. And if it's healing, it comes from the spiritual experience. We're not going to focus anything on healing. And then the Santo Daime said no, because they thought that um, their services were not sufficiently supportive for people with real major PTSD. So I think that's what, what you're finding. Yeah. You're pointing yeah. To. So I, th I think that a lot of times people are unprepared um, in these ayahuasca ceremonies for the, they don't get the support that they need. They don't get the preparation. They don't get the integration. Um, but a lot of times it can be helpful for people. But I think that even when I do group therapy, one of the things that we're thinking about is that everybody um, should have an individual experience with MDMA. Every PTSD patient should have an individual experience with MDMA before they do it in a group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's good. So, yeah. so there's not, I, I think the challenge is that. Um, one of the things that we're noticing, too, that the way that people heal from PTSD is they reframe their story. They tell a new story. Yeah. And so when they're telling the story to the therapists, they're telling it to themselves, too. Yeah. And so if there's not enough opportunity to tell your story to the right. therapists, you're, you're not going to be um, integrate, anchoring it in your own mind in the same yeah. way. Yep. So um, on the other hand, group therapy will be less expensive. Um, so how do we take advantage of groups? But, um, so, uh, but I also think that there's a lot of traveling, uh, shamans, you know, that come for ceremonies and then they take a certain amount of money for everybody for the ceremony. And then they're gone to the next one and they don't pay any attention to integration. Correct. I, I, I think that's dangerous, yeah. uh, be, because really you stir things up and then you leave. Yeah. Now, a lot of times, most yeah. of the times, hopefully people will be fine they, they can integrate themselves, but. The integration process is absolutely crucial. Vital. And uh, for long-term benefits or even to avoid short-term problems. So yeah. um, I, I do um, worry about um, these kind of settings. And so I would say that more and more what's happening is that we have the psychedelic integration list on the MAPS website. And there's also a group called psychedelic.support. So these are therapists that are comfortable with psychedelics, um, but you know, it's illegal to offer psychedelics. So they offer preparation and integration for mm -hmm. people that have had their own psychedelic experience. Cool. Yeah. And so I, I, I just encourage, again, people that are um, listening, if they have had these kind of experiences that they've um, had difficult time integrating, or if they want to prepare more thoroughly, 
um, the psychedelic integration list on the MAPS website or psychedelic.support. Um, I, I think those are important resources that are happening more and more that are being available more and more. Yeah, cool. Thanks. It's validating. All right. Last question. Um, I often uh, ask all my guests that this question, which is one of our missions is to reach a million teens and young adults with relationship education, get our young people more relationally connected. And, and I'm curious uh, if I had a room full of say a thousand teens and young adults, uh, and, I, and you were whispering in my ear, and I could only share with them one thing about kind of advice for relationships and life. Um, what would you want me to share with them? Um, well, I'll, I'll say two things. The first thing I would say is um, MDMA would be great for you to try in a relationship or even by yourself. I, I just was so awkward in my adolescence. I could barely talk to girls. I you know, if I just think if I'd done MDMA when I was uh, bar misfit or, you know, 12 or 13 or 14 or 15, I would have had a way better time in high school because I wouldn't have been so scared and shy and I've been able to express my emotions. Yeah. Um, and, and actually, the FDA is saying that if we succeed in adults, we have to work with traumatized adolescents, mm -hmm. uh, 12 to 17 year olds. So, so the first awesome. thing I would say is that I, I really think that uh, adolescence is a great time. Um, under a supervised safe situation with safe drugs, though this is in the future, you can whisper, try and be but, but the other thing I would say about a relationship is that um, uh, give what you want to get. Mm -hmm. Basically, if nice. you want to get love, give love, you know, be love, express it. And that instead of thinking that it's only going to come from somebody else to you, that if you um, offer it, if you give it, you have it. You are living in love and, and you are more likely to get that back. Yeah. So I, I would say, you know, give out love, give what you want, be kind. If you want kindness, be kind. Like, yeah. you know, and if you want to be a good listener, you know, if you want somebody to listen to you, be a good listener to them. Uh, yeah. And I, I'd say that's probably the the main thing. Yeah. Awesome. And I'm assuming you've, you've given such advice maybe to your kids, your own kids, like, would yeah. you encourage, you know? Well, when our kids, okay, this is a bigger story, a bigger topic, but let's just say the cultures that have successfully integrated psychedelics, the Native American church with peyote, the ayahuasca churches, they don't have age limits. They let their, I went to a Native American peyote ceremony for a friend's wedding. Uh, Navajo Indian brought his nine-year-old son and yeah. he stayed up all night with us. He took smaller amounts of peyote. But I think that um, when I was 13, I had a bar mitzvah and I was so deeply disappointed that it didn't turn me into a man. Uh -huh. I thought this rite of passage would do something, and I just was left empty. I mean, I got a bunch of good presents, so it wasn't empty-handed, really. Yeah, but, but I didn't I have any yeah. spiritual things. So what I felt was um, that I was ready at thirteen to have some kind of spiritual experience. So when our kids turned thirteen, my wife and I said to them, "If you want marijuana or you want MDMA, come to us, and we'll give it to you, and you can do it with us." And and so. Ironically, that turned out to be the best anti-drug strategy that we could have thought of. <laughs> the, the idea that uh, these kids were like, oh, yeah, do drugs with my mother and father. But it also made it so it wasn't a symbol of rebellion. Right. Totally. They, they went to these drugs later than some of their friends. And our daughter, when she was um, almost 16, she came to us and she said, I would like to smoke pot and I want to do it for the first time with you. Yeah, it was fantastic. It was beautiful. Yeah, that's so cool. You know, I think they've all done, all of our kids, uh, all three of our kids have done MDMA. Um, they've done it with friends or in relationships. Um, I, I think the, yeah. uh, the, you know, they have done it in some celebratory contexts as well. Sure. But I, I felt kids. that um, one of the worst parts of the drug war is that it makes it so parents are not honest with their children mm -hmm. in a lot of cases. I, I still have friends that hide the fact they smoke pot from their kids. Yeah, right. I mean, it's absurd. And so you, you've got this drug war that, that kind of makes parents frightened about um, being honest with their own kids. And yeah, and then they're double standard. And then they're confirming all adolescents like, yeah, see, you, you can't trust adults anyway, because they're just full of shit. Yeah. And then you sneak off to do pot and they figure it out anyway. I know. <laughs> <laughs> they're pretty smart, these kids. Yeah. Well, Rick, where? thanks so much again for your time and all your heart and uh, trailblazing here. Where can folks donate to MAPS uh, and find you? Well, um, so um, I'm at rick at maps.org. So, or ask MAPS if they got general questions. Ask, ask MAPS at maps.org. 
Okay. Uh, maps.org is where people can uh, check out enormous amount of information on our website. And that's also where they can donate. And we have had this sort of, um, we've got about um, 3,000 members every year that donate. Um, and so we'd like to build that up. So we, we are trying to, uh, particularly, you know, now that there's things that are going on, like uh, Denver making mushrooms the lowest enforcement priority, Oakland, Ann Arbor is doing that, the Oregon Psilocybin Initiative, there, there's more reasons to have larger memberships. Mm-hmm. Um, because there's now sort of an expression of political support for certain drug policy reform things. So we Absolutely. very much like uh, to increase our membership. We have um, uh, a newsletter that we mail to members. Um, we do put it up for free on the website too, but um, maps.org is where you can have an enormous amount of information. We encourage cool. you to consider joining. Awesome. Rick, thanks so much, man. It was great meeting you and connecting. Yeah, and thanks to Will for uh, connecting us. Yeah, totally. Thanks, Will. Yeah, awesome. Good to have a new friend on the path here. Thank you. Yeah, yeah terrific. And maybe one day we'll do um, more of these uh, MDMA for couples therapy studies and we can talk just about that. Yeah, I would love that. Okay, awesome. Go to maps.org to find out more about Rick Doblin. And uh, if you want to donate, for example, to maps, um, please do that. It, uh, it really helps them um, get the psychedelics that are safe in a safe controlled setting into treatment clinics across the planet. And I feel really, really excited about this. Yeah. Uh, okay. Action step. Um, let's do mild and spicy here. Mild would be to just share this podcast with someone who could handle it maybe and talk about it and uh, debrief like, huh, is this something I want to do someday? Um, is this legitimate? Like, what do I think about what he said? You know, just have a discussion. I think that's really valuable. Uh, if you want to turn up the heat a notch, then I would, you know, uh, encourage you to maybe do something legal, like go to um, a holotropic breathwork experience. I think that's the most accessible thing here. If you don't want to go outside the lines of what's um, legal currently, um, I, I just didn't really encourage it, the holotropic breathwork stuff. I think it's really cool. And then um, if you have PTSD, I just want to encourage you to look up on MAPS website, follow the instructions that Rick outlined, and apply to be a client and see if you can work through some of your PTSD. Uh, we've done a couple episodes around PTSD. I, I hope they've been helpful for you. And um, the results they're seeing with um, PTSD patients, clients are pretty unbelievable with MDMA. Um, and they're getting closer, as Rick said, to making that a reality and legal so that uh, any of us can go to a clinic and receive this kind of treatment. It's, uh, it's very promising. And my friends here in Boulder uh, at the Integrative Psychiatric Institute are um, doing ketamine-assisted psychotherapy, which is another place you could look um, in your local city. Those clinics are popping up all over the place, and that's totally legal. So you might check out ketamine-assisted psychotherapy. And um, yeah, I'm just psyched that uh, this is happening in the world. I think it's going to help all of us a lot. Okay, come join our community at relationshipschool.com forward slash community if you want to join our free Facebook group. And if you are still wanting to check out our conflict event where you can actually learn two days with me live virtual over Zoom, come play with us, relationshipschool.com forward slash connected. All right. Okay, everybody, thanks again, and we'll talk very soon. Hey, thanks so much for listening. Please subscribe to this YouTube channel. Share one of these videos with a friend. We want to help the planet get their act together around relationships, and you are one of them, so thank you. Thank you.